Well, we're turning uh, this morning again to 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you will, turn into your Bibles uh, with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, in, uh, we're moving on to another sentence. Believe it or not, we've spent four weeks on a single sentence. But that's Peter's fault. Uh, well, we might be able to just blame the Holy Spirit for inspiring Peter uh, or entrusting to Peter uh, the pen to write out what, he, what God wanted him to uh, write to us. Uh, because verses 3 through 12 are a single sentence. And we finally made it through that in the last of several weeks. And now we're looking at a, a shorter sentence in verse 13 and then a, another sentence in verses 14 through 16 this morning. And so we're going to begin reading with verse 13. All right, let me uh, read again what uh, Miss Angie so beautifully read earlier and uh, bring our minds back to this passage. In verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, preparing your minds for action, and being sober-minded, so those are the two descriptions of the, of the mental state that we should be in. Being in that mental state, then, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How many of you realize today that of all the grace that we have received, which we've received a lot of grace, would you agree with that? Say amen if you agree. Okay, we've received a tremendous amount of grace. But that is just a smidgen compared to the grace that is yet to be brought to us when Christ comes. We can't even begin to think about the, the mounds of grace that God has for those for whom he is coming to, to receive to himself. But he goes on, verse 14, new sentence. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he, God, who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, and we'll see where it's written. You shall be holy, for I am holy. This is... The word of God for us today, and we want to give thanks to that. Lord, we pray that as we reflect on your words from 1 Peter, especially this great command that you have given, you gave millennia ago to your people, and you give it to today to us, your people, to be holy, for you are holy. Lord, let us, let us understand that and to, and to be holy by your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the theme we've been tracking through First Peter is a theme of suffering. Now, that's not a, that's not a uh, theme that any of us like. We don't like suffering. We don't ask for suffering. We don't pray for suffering. And yet, what we find in First Peter is that if you are a follower of Christ, then uh, you are going to have to be ready to suffer for Him. Because remember, again, the, the symbol, the most basic symbol of the Christian faith is... The cross. The cross is a symbol of suffering. And so, uh, so, so many times as, as, as Christians, we, our mind kind of strays quite, quite far from this idea of what the cross really means, right? Uh, we, we do a really good job of beautifying the cross, making it look all pretty and nice. Uh, but don't ever forget what the cross means. It means suffering. And so we're going to First Peter. We're going through here. And we're keeping our eye out for suffering. And, and as we come to this passage in verses 13 through 16, this, this all fits into a, a, a line of thought that Peter has been unveiling. It began, it began in verse 3 with just a, a, an overwhelming moment in Peter's life where he just was seeing and thinking about the glories that lie ahead for those who are God's people. He kind of shares some of that vision with us. He talks about the living hope that we have, the, the heavenly inheritance that we have. And he, he, he wants to put that out in front of us so that we know that, hey, when we suffer, uh, there's something that's coming. There's a great grace that's coming. And then he talks uh, after that, he, then he says, uh, but there, there is suffering. We're, we're going to suffer. And when you do go through various trials, just know this. Know that it's just for a little while. 
just for a little while, and there's something great on the other end. We're, we're, we're suffering for something. We're suffer, suffering. If we're suffering for Christ, we're suffering for something. But then he comes in this passage, and he wants to remind us uh, that uh, in our suffering, he wants us to be especially careful that we don't fall back into our previous ways of thinking. Now, when you have a headache, or when you are you have a stomach ache, or when you just don't feel well, uh, I don't know. Probably many of us, probably maybe most of us, we automatically think of, okay, what can I do to get rid of that, right? And take some Tylenol for the headache, uh, whatever you do for a stomach ache, or whatever other aches and pains you may have, right? Uh, that's that's almost become a part of our daily routine, has it not? Uh, you have a little bit of ache, you take something for it, right? Why? Because we don't like suffering. We don't like any kind of pain. We don't. And, uh, now be honest with me, how many of you, when you don't feel well, you get cranky? Anyone, anyone honest enough to, all right, raise your hand. Okay, uh, we have a few honest people. Uh, the rest of you will meet you at the altar at the end of the service. <laughs> But we, we, we do tend to, to just kind of, we don't feel good, and so then we don't feel good towards other people. And, uh, and that's tough. That's a tough thing. Here's what Peter's going to tell us in this passage. Especially in light of suffering, be careful that you don't fall back into your old sinful ways. Because suffering is a trial of your faith. It is a trial of whether or not you are going to remain faithful. And so that's why he's talking about holiness here, being holy in all of our conduct. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in this verse, the sentence begins with the word therefore, and as the old uh, sermon uh, adage goes, when you see a therefore, you have to ask why it's there, what it's there for, right? And the reason it's there is because of what Paul has been saying about this heavenly vision and the suffering that we're going to endure. That for a little while, but that there have been people since the beginning of creation who have suffered for this, for this faith. It's an ancient faith. And so because of all of that, because of what does lie ahead of us, but what is between where we are now and what is yet to come, namely, probably some suffering, he says, now listen, listen, in your life, be holy. Be holy. Now, um, you may not have heard this too much unless you spent a lot of times in Ephesians 5 because this is where uh, Ephesians 5 talks a lot about this. Ezekiel does as well. But there's one aspect of holiness that we don't often think too much about. And that is, uh, and I think Peter here, this is important for Peter because uh, all of this is couched in the idea of it is by, by, by being holy that we are preparing ourselves for what's to come. Namely, the coming of of the bridegroom to receive his bride. And so holiness, holiness, get this, has much to do with beautifying our life. To be the call to be holy is a call to live a beautiful life. Now this is going to come up in 1 Peter 3, all right? We're going to come back to the idea. So just kind of tuck that away, all right, in, in your head, and we'll come back to that page uh, when we get to 1 Peter 3, maybe in 2025. Uh, when we get to that point, uh, we, we'll bring that back because uh, holiness has a lot to do with beauty, beautifying our life, living a life that's, that's beautiful, all right? And uh, that's, that's going to be very, very important for us. But let's look at uh, what Peter is telling us here. He, he's saying, first of all, that uh, a couple of things that, he, that we are to fill our life with, that, that our life is to, for it to be beautiful, it has to be, it has to be filled with two things. One is, is hope, people of hope. We want to be people of hope, and the other is people of, of holiness. Uh, and he's going to talk specifically about our conduct here, not you know, making ourselves look all pretty. He's not concerned about that. He's about, he's about let your conduct be beautiful here. He's going to talk about both of these two. So let's, let's see if we can get through these two ideas. Being full of hope, first of all, in verse 13. There are two ways that Peter tells us that we 
that we set our hope fully, our, our, our set fully on the grace that we will be brought to us in the revelation of Jesus Christ. That we have a full hope. There are two ways, and I mentioned them already. The one is preparing your minds for action. And secondly, by being sober-minded. Let's, let's look at these for just a moment. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and again, be honest with me. Who among you, among us, I should say, uh, because I may or may not have to raise my hand on this, uh, who among us are the ones who you know months ahead of time that you are going to be traveling somewhere, maybe on vacation or somewhere, you know months ahead of time. You've had, you have plenty of time to prepare. And an hour before you leave, someone says, all right, are you all ready to pack up and load? And you have not even pulled out your suitcase. All right, how many of, how many of you are, that's, that's you? All right, all right, I see a few hands, I see a few hands. Uh, we may have one or two of those in our own family. Uh, and, and you just know it. I mean, it doesn't matter how long ahead of time you, you have to prepare. Uh, when it comes down to the final hour, someone has not yet started packing. You just know it. You just count on it, right? Peter says, prepare your minds for action. How do you know when a person is ready, prepared? Well, they start packing, if that's what needs to be done. They start planning. They start putting things together. In fact, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was at the ministerial for the Heartland Conference I'm a part of. So all the pastors were gathered there, and uh, Dr. Hutchinson was, was speaking, and, and he said something like this. I'll probably misquote him, but it was something like this. Uh, he says, um, he said, you're not really planning for something unless you are, uh, oh, no, he said, you're not really valuing something unless you're planning for it. You're not really valuing something unless it's in your budget. You're not really valuing something unless you are carving out time for it. You're not really valuing something unless it's on your calendar. And he gave several different examples of, of and as I'm saying, oh, yeah, okay, that's true, that's true, that's true. Yeah, that, yeah that, you can pretty much, if you were to show me your, your bank statements or uh, your credit card statements or whatever it is you use, your checkbook, anyone use checkbooks anywhere? Uh, if, you were to, if you were to show me your, your calendar of schedule, if you're a person who keeps a calendar, if you were to show me uh, you know, what, you're, what you're planning for, I would probably be able to tell pretty much what the things are that you value, right? Because you put some time, you put some effort into it. Well, Peter's saying here, prepare your minds. Prepare yourself mentally. Prepare your minds for action. No, the King James, you got to love the King James here. Uh, I think it uses the phrase, and someone can double-check me to make sure I got it right, but it uses this, this phrase, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins. Why, why does it use that? Well, it's because uh, in the Greek, it's, it's referring to a, a Hebrew idiom, and so that's, uh, that's actually pretty accurate. Gird up the loins of your mind. What in the world does that mean? Well, there's actually an illustration there. It's actually a word picture. That, uh, that, J uh, that Peter is using here because this is a phrase that's used often in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the girding, the girding up is what a soldier or an athlete would do. And of course, you know, the, the ancient uh, era, they would wear... Uh, they would wear robes of some sort. They would wear some kind of robe. And if you were a, uh, if you were an athlete or uh, if you were a soldier, of course, you had a different garb for that. But you knew if you needed, on a moment's notice, if you weren't properly uh, uh, clothed for battle or for a race, but you had your robe on, in order to run, what would you have to do? You'd have to pull that robe up and you'd have to tuck it into your waistband so that your legs were free. You couldn't, you couldn't have something entangling your, your, your feet and your legs to slow you down or to trip you up. And so Peter is literally saying in your mind, gird your mind, prepare your mind by, by fixing yourself in such a way that you're ready to run uninhibited freely, without the danger of falling, without the danger of injuring yourself. So in other words, 
there's, there's a mental toughness that you have to have to make it through this, this Christian life, which may involve a lot of suffering. So he's talking about being mentally tough here. And really, the second point, be sober-minded. Uh, really the same point. Be sober-minded. Be clear-headed. Be self-controlled. Don't allow your, the, the, the muscles of your brain to become weak. Don't become spiritually weak. Prepare yourselves for something difficult. So this, one of the reasons I'm, I'm even going through First Peter is because I believe we live in a world and an age where, uh, where suffering has become, has become almost anti-Christian, as if we view, well, if you're suffering, you must just not have enough faith. Where what we ought to be saying is, if you're suffering, you must be a person of great faith. I think we live in a world where, where our culture tells us that, uh, you know, hey, if you're, if, you're, if you're a good Christian, you know, just, just get along and, and uh, uh, you know, don't, don't rock the boat too much. You know, don't, you know, the gospel stuff, don't, you know, don't want to be too loud about that. You don't want, you want someone to be offended out there or you don't, uh, you know, we don't need to bring attention to ourselves. And I think, uh, I think the apostles, if they were alive today, I think they'd be shouting from the rooftops and they would probably be persecuted for it too, right? I think we're being challenged today because uh, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime, maybe in my children or grandchildren's lifetime, there's going to come a day, and it may come sooner than later, where God will entrust to us suffering for his sake. I have to ask myself, Lord, I don't want suffering, but why aren't we suffering more? And I have to wonder, is it because, Lord, our faith is so small is it because I'm so, uh, I'm just not bold enough to speak for Christ? Maybe, maybe not. God, God in his way. Now, again, remember, let's go back to one of the early sermons here. Uh, it's, it, it, even, even Jesus told us uh, suffering is not going to be, thank God, suffering is not going to be continuous. But there is to be an expectation that we may suffer for the sake of Christ. And so again, the reason we're going through this is because I think the time will come. The time will come sooner or later. And if we are not ready, if we, are, if we don't recognize suffering for Jesus Christ, then we really do put at jeopardy the faith, especially of our children and our grandchildren. Will they really see what it means to follow Christ? Will they really know what the cross means? So we are to be, have a prepared mind, be sober-minded, set our hope fully on the grace, the grace of Christ, which is our only hope of salvation. So there at the end of verse 13, he is clearly talking about the grace that is coming at the revelation of Christ, at his second coming. We're getting ready to go into Advent. We sang some songs today about, about the coming of Christ. And here we are living between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And there ought to be something that defines our life that is similar to those who were looking for the Messiah the first time, those who were longing for the Messiah. We too long for the Messiah, but we long for him to come now a second time and so as we go through the next few weeks we will probably spend a little bit of time looking at some of the prophets and some of those passages of people who were who are longing and, and aching for the coming of the messiah and we joined them we joined them in their longing and their hope that that the messiah would come the messiah who is jesus christ now let's look at the next sentence in verses 14 through 16 as obedient children do not be conformed to the passions of your former former ignorance now get this faith is always indicated signified by obedience obedience doesn't make us children we are children only by adoption Yet children who love their parents obey them. It is the estranged child who closes his ear to the father. As children, we are called to reflect the father, to be living images of the father. This idea of being an obedient child is, a, is one who follows the pattern, the behavior, the character of the parent, of the father. So he begins, as obedient 
children, as obedient children. Follow the pattern. Follow the pattern rather than, he says, so there's a contrast here. Be obedient children, follow the pattern rather than following the pattern of our previous life. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Instead of following the pattern of the world or being conformed to the world, we are to follow the pattern of the Holy Father. Now, old habits die hard, right? Old habits die hard. I don't know what habit it is that you are trying to, to kick. I don't know what habit it is that you are trying to overcome. Uh, but if, it's, if it is an old habit that, is, uh, that just wants to drag you back into your old ways of living, uh, those old desires of the flesh, those things that you have done your best to set behind you and never go back to, but this is a habit that just seems to just keep taking you steps backward. Can I tell you something? First of all, just keep fighting. Keep fighting, all right? Keep praying. Share that with some brothers or sisters that they can come alongside you to help you overcome those things because we have here some clear truth. That is, we are to give our best effort and prepare our minds first to, to conform not to the world, not to our previous life, but to our Father in heaven. To conform our lives to Him, to Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, that's interesting. He says not to be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You remember, you remember your old life? Uh, you just always did whatever felt like it was the right thing to do or the best thing or uh, whatever would feel good at the moment. It's just are your passions, your desires controlled you. Now, if we were honest with ourselves, we might have to admit more than what we might care to that uh, sometimes our passions get the best of us. I um, mean, it's really hard to go downstairs and, and, and resist the monkey bread uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, it's really hard at, at, at Thanksgiving to uh, not try all of the desserts on the table, right? And there, there are some things that are, are, are really, really difficult, but we're not to be controlled by those. And whether it's food or something else, God expects us, he wants us to exhibit, yes, some self-control, begin to, to develop a fortitude that will bring... The, I, I've, I, I think I've learned this. I mean, I'm learn, I should say I am learning. Uh, food is one of the most difficult things to control. Uh, you can say, man, it is one of the most difficult things to control. And... Uh, and, 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 I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I'll, just, I'll raise my hand on this and say, there, there's, I mean, I love pumpkin pie. Or there's some, certain things I just love, right? I, if, you, if you grow up in, in this church, at least, um, on, at Sunday uh, afternoon dinner, you have, you know, 10 carbs and uh, maybe one non-carb, whatever that would be, right? And you leave that off your plate and you eat all the carbs, right? And then you have dessert afterwards. Uh, it's just that's that's we, we love we love our mashed potatoes and gravy. We love our uh, our our noodles, right? Beef noodles or uh, maybe um, turkey noodles today. I don't know what you have today, but uh, we, we we love that stuff. But it's diff it's a difficult thing, and you know it's all right to say I'm having a hard time overcoming this particular desire. It's okay to say that, all right. It's all right to say that. Why? Because we all, we're all in the same boat. We all have to overcome those things. And God has invited us. How do we do that? By preparing our mind. The battle's right here between the ears. That's where the battle begins. That's why Paul, Peter, uh, specifically under the Holy Spirit's inspiration, is directing his attention to our mind. Get your mind in the right place. Right? Get your mind in the right place and the heart will follow. It is really really difficult to keep our minds in the right place though isn't it if it were easy peter wouldn't even have to tell us to worry about it it's really difficult when you are uh when you're when you're running a race pam when you're running and you're at whatever mile mile for pam probably 60 uh, and and your right, and your body is telling you to stop, but you you know, you know you're just you're just you're just ahead. You're just you're you're going to finish soon, right? You're, everything in your body is telling you, and your mind is telling you stop, right? It's a mental battle. It's a physical battle. But it's a mental battle. 
Some of you, even this very week and, and probably this coming week, you will, you will fight, you will face some things. And guess what? The, the battle is going to take place first right here, right here. Now, here's what's dangerous. What's dangerous is when we think to ourselves, okay, I've got this. It's just in my mind. I've got this. I don't need to tell anyone about it. It's just my mind. Just make up my mind. Now, we call that white knuckling it. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Where you just think you can just get a grip on it and hold on as tight as you can and just on your own, you can just, you can overcome this. Now, I will say, you're not going to overcome without some mental preparedness, all right? But you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. It's not just grip that seed or hold on and just try to white knuckle it through. That's not what it's about. But it's about receiving the grace that God has given to us, first of all through the Holy Spirit, but through His people as well. And this is why it's so important for that mental battle that takes place in your mind, for you not to just keep it in your mind but to find someone that you know cares for you and loves you and is willing to help carry that burden so that they can help carry that because then that takes the battle not just from the mind, but it takes it and, and, and it actually will, will bring it out so it's out there on the open. Because here's the thing, the, the enemy that is the most dangerous is the one that you don't see, right? And you may think that you see the enemy. The enemy is far, let me just say, uh, the enemy of our soul is a lot smarter than what we are. He's been around a lot longer than we are. He has all sorts of tricks up his sleeve and how to get us to stumble in the fall. And one of those is for us to isolate ourselves and just think, oh, I can get this. Prepare your mind. Be sober-minded. Be obedient children. That means follow after someone, namely our Father. But father, uh, follow after the spiritual parents that God has given you as they are following Jesus Christ. Well, let me move on. So there's a great contrast there in verse 14. And it reminds me of our, this verse as I was reading it uh, a week or two ago. It reminded me of the baptismal renunciation. By the way, if there's anyone here that uh, you have, uh, you, you would like to be baptized, you're a believer and you've not been baptized, please talk to me. And um, we actually have a class coming up and beginning in January uh, in preparation for uh, our next baptismal service, but I want to put, make sure that you get a uh, place in our list. But this is the baptismal renunciation, and we would do well to, to repeat this often, but it says this, do you renounce the devil and all his works, the vain pomp and glory of the world, yes, it's old, old English, with all the covetous desires of the same, the carnal desires of the flesh, so that you will not follow or be led by them. And the baptismal candidates Respond, I renounce them all. The great renunciation. You see, when you, when, to prepare your mind, you've got you've to say no like you mean it, right? I think it's uh, Brother David Fulton. I think he has a sermon. Someone, you have to remind me after the service, but he has a sermon. And I remember he gives this illustration. Um, and I don't remember the whole illustration, but I remember he really emphasized, like, you've got to say no like you mean it, right? Saying no like you mean it. Not just like, eh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, just, yeah, maybe not right now, you know. No, like, just, no, no, once and for all. And then you got to keep saying it, right? No to this and yes to the right things. No to that, yes to that. Have, have you ever had to just, you've been all alone, all by yourself for some reason, and you just had to say no out loud just for yourself? Has anyone ever been there? I have. Anyone else have been there? All right. Okay, so three of us. All right. I'm glad, I'm glad I shared that experience with two. Thank you. Yeah, you just, you have to say no. No. I won't think that. No, I'm not going to allow my mind to take me down that road. I refuse. You know what? Maybe, maybe more of you need to be saying no out loud when you're all alone, all right? Uh, and maybe there are some things that you need to be saying yes to. Yes to this. Yes, this is, this is where, this is the path that God wants me to go. This is where my mind should be going. So yes, I'm going to go, go that. I'm going to go that way. You, as, as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. That is, imitate Christ as obedient children. 
Holiness is that which is consistent with the character of God. Holiness, if you just want a simple definition, is godliness. It's be like Christ. He that is a Christian comes into a communion with Christ and is a partaker with him of all his goodness. And therefore, seeing that Christ is holy, his members must also need be holy or else deny that Christ is holy. There's no part of our life that is untouched or that God intends to leave untouched by his sanctifying grace. For it is written in verse 16, it says, It is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Those are the word of our Lord. That, that, going back all the way back to the days of Moses, you can read it multiple times in the books of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, where God goes to his people and he says, Be holy, for I am holy. He's quoting particularly uh, one of my favorite passages is uh, the love chapter of the Old Testament. You know what the love chapter of the Old Testament is? It's Leviticus 19. You should mark that. Leviticus 19 is the love chapter of the Old Testament. It really kind of goes into Leviticus 20 as well. Beautiful passage, uh, just powerful, referred to many times uh, later in scriptures. And, and here, among other times, the Lord says, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, interestingly, the calls to holiness in the Old Testament, they appear in two different ways. One is that we are to, to consecrate ourselves. We are to sanctify ourselves. Be holy. Sanctify. Consecrate yourself. Set yourselves apart. We, we see that command multiple times, especially in Leviticus. But then there's a second way in which we are sanctified, and that is as in Leviticus 20, verse 8, where, where God says, I will sanctify you to myself. Now, both of, both of these are true. We consecrate ourselves, we purify ourselves, and God sanctifies us. Both of those are true, but how can we reconcile those? Well, first of all, we simply cannot, we, we cannot just simply sanctify ourselves. It's not within our power. We must have the grace of God. The command to cleanse ourselves, to, to purify ourselves, and the invitation to be cleansed by God means this. That we consecrate ourselves by allowing God's purifying work to take place in our lives. It is a theology of non-resistance. Just don't resist what God is doing in your life. That's how you consecrate yourself. You submit yourself to the sanctifying power of God because only God can make you clean. It is saying yes and only yes to God's sanctifying grace in our life. Sanctification is what God does for us, in us, to us, for those who are receptive to his grace. The baseline of the Christian life is a readiness to receive God's sanctifying grace. That's the baseline. And so, fitting this in conclusion all into the idea of suffering for Christ. To suffer for Christ is to suffer as one who is striving after holiness. Not suffering for sin. There is a suffering for sin. That's not what Peter's talking about. He will talk about that later in the passage, in, the, in, in this letter. But suffering for righteousness' sake. Suffering for righteousness' sake. That is, we suffer for Christ when... We, our desire and our attempt to live holy in all of our conduct is met with resistance in this world because it will be. You will face resistance, but by God's grace, you can face that resistance with the knowledge that you are following our Father, the character of our Father as obedient children. And so as we, uh, as we go through this week and then we, next week we begin to focus on on of preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ. We do so because we recognize that one of the reasons God sent his son, of course, is for our, for our uh, sin and for our salvation, right? First and foremost. But also in order to give us the pattern to follow. The pattern to follow. 
And so one of the things we do during the season of Advent is we look at our own life. We, we look inward. We, we reflect. And we look and we, and introspectively. Lord, how can I be better prepared for your coming? And so we will try to impress upon uh, ourselves the, not only the duty, but the invitation to be a prepared people. For Christ is coming again, and he, with, with him he is bringing the grace that we hope for. Praise be to his name. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to invite uh, brother, uh, those who are going to help serve communion this morning, and we're going to receive uh, the elements at the conclusion here of the service. It's fitting and right and our grateful duty to that we should at all times and all places give thanks to Almighty God and to remember his suffering, his death, his burial, his ascension, and his, the fact that he is coming again. And so we want to make our humble confession to the Lord. Would you join with me as we recite the, the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that, the one, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. For truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Almighty God, we ask that you would consecrate these elements of bread and wine, that in receiving them, we may receive them in faith and receive grace from your hand. In Jesus' name. You who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins, are in love and charity with your brothers and sisters. You intend to lead a new life following after the commandments of God and walking henceforth in his holy ways. Christ extends the invitation to you to come and to receive this sacrament to your comfort and make your holy confession to Almighty God.